Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. Before motion pictures, reliable camera equipment, Google, the only way scientists could impart the enormous breadth and scope of the natural world, besides handwritten notes and sketch drawings, was to bring physical specimens back from the field and into the laboratory or museum. This included shooting and skinning animals, birds and reptiles. It included preserving delicate marine organisms in bottles of alcohol. It included pressing and drying plants and accumulating pounds and pounds of rocks and fossils. Early scientific expeditions typically returned with staggering amounts of objects from the field. The typical natural history institution displays only about 1% or less of its specimen collection. The rest, often hundreds of thousands of specimens, are cataloged and stored away, inaccessible to the public. Unlike exhibit quality taxidermy, Scientific specimens, like study skins, are prepared to be uniform and compact, able to fit and be stored in tiny museum drawers. Study skins provide a wealth of information about the external characteristics of an animal. With a large enough collection, one can see the range of a species from geography, age, changing seasons, and even the time period. One large collection of a species of birds, for instance, show all of the subtle changes in plumage over the season. The visible portion of the museum is typically for the public, to excite and inspire. Many natural history museums, in America and in the Western world, were developed during the 19th century. These museums are places to view and understand nature, and they are also places that have a history in themselves. Museum goers look at dioramas of rare or extinct taxidermied animals, perhaps realizing that some of those animals behind glass were among the last of their kind, solemnly gunned down so that they might not be totally lost to us here in the 21st century and beyond. Today, we are going to discuss the history of natural history museums in America and really in the Western world. I'm Elizabeth. And I'm Arissa. And we're your historians for this episode of DIG. Collections of natural curiosities can be traced back to Paleolithic times. People collect stuff. Perhaps we're like little magpies. We're always constantly curious about the world around us, and we have an insatiable need to figure stuff out. But we also like looking at cool The word museum has classical origins. I'm going to butcher this, right? Um, But in its Greek form, museion uh, meant seat of the muses and designated a philosophical institution or a place of contemplation. But these were more like pseudo universities, not really places of collection. Uh, So think Ptolemy's Museum at Alexandria. Where we've all, we've all been there, obviously. obviously. (laughs) Um, Many Chinese emperors promoted the arts, which manifested in fine works of painting, calligraphy, metalwork, jade, glass, and pottery. The Han Emperor, Wu Ti, um, he reigned from 141 to 87 BCE, established an academy that contained paintings and calligraphies from each of the Chinese provinces. And the last Han Emperor, Xian Ti, Um, who abdicated in A.D. 220, established a gallery containing portraits of his ministers. At roughly the same time, Islamic communities were making collections of relics at the tombs of early Muslim martyrs. The idea of vaqf, excuse me if I pronounce that wrong, formalized by Muhammad himself, whereby property was given for the public good and for religious purposes, also resulted in the formation of collections. The word museum was revived in the 15th century Europe to describe the collection of the Medici in Florence. The Medici family was a political dynasty and later a royal house founded on banking, wealth, and patronage. The family controlled Florence for centuries, so much so that four Medici men became popes of the Catholic Church. 
Cosimo Medici, or Cosimo I, uh, who ruled from 1519 to 1574, became a passionate collector of antiquities and rare objects. His collection was then carried on and built upon by his descendants. In 1570, a secret studiolo was built for Francesco de' Medici, who became the first Grand Duke of Tuscany and ruler of the Florentine state in 1574, inside the Palazzo Medici. In order to display some of the Medici paintings, the upper floor of the Uffizi Palace, uh, which was designed to hold offices, or Uffizi. Oh, that's funny. I never knew that that's what it was. Oh, okay. Offices and Uffizi. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, it was converted and opened to the public in 1582. The entire collection was bequeathed to the state in 1743 to be accessible, quote, to the people of Tuscany and to all the nations. Dutch. At the end of the 16th century, establishing a museum was common across Europe in courtly circles. They took on different forms and names according to the setting and, uh, and the collections. Pendecion, Studiolo, Gabinetto, Wunderkammer, Galleria, and Kunstkammer. Oh, I don't know what that one means. Um, it's probably Dutch, right? Kunstkammer? I would imagine. So these cabinets, which um, have become known as cabinets of curiosities, at least in the English-speaking world, were initially a room that might include books, coins, artwork, and natural history-type stuff. Right. Uh, an early naturalist was a Danish physician, Olas Verm, whose museum Vermarium in 1655 held buckets and bins of crystals amid piles of dried pufferfish. He had dried snake skins on the walls, as well as a stuffed lemur, iguanas, and an armadillo. Stuffed birds, fish hung from the ceiling. Cool. This reminds me of the penis museum. <laughs> Have you ever seen? No. Oh, there's like oh, a... Oh, is that where they have like all of the different animal penises yeah. everywhere? Yeah. yeah. Where is that? Iceland, I'm pretty sure. Probably. Haven't you? It's on, it's on Netflix. I think I'm pretty sure it's Iceland. The great voyages of exploration during the 16th and 17th centuries were what really pushed the interest in collection um, of natural history artifacts or natural curiosities. Early collectors prized the strange and unusual. Aesthetics determined the layout of early museums more than, say, region or function. So a stuffed alligator might live right next to an ostrich egg, even if they couldn't have lived together and in, in geography yeah, yeah like yeah. geographically it's more just how they looked cool together on the wall <laughs> <laughs> right. kind of like my house <laughs> in 1758 with the publication of the encyclopedic systema natura carl linnaeus attempted to classify nature linnaeus was a swedish botanist physician and zoologist who created the modern system of naming organisms called binomial nomenclature the Linnaean system classified nature within a nested hierarchy, starting with three kingdoms. Kingdoms were divided into classes, and they in turn into orders and thence into genera, which were divided into species. Below the rank of species, he sometimes recognized taxa of a lower rank. These have since acquired standardized names such as variety and botany and subspecies in zoology. Modern taxonomy includes a rank of family between order and genus and a rank of phylum between kingdom and class that were not present in Linnaeus's original system. Linnaeus recorded the sense of wonder evoked by the astonishing colors, extremes of size, and unique structures in the natural world. Scientists, both professional and layperson, set about naming and categorizing animal and plant species. In the 18th century, a London-based naturalist, Sir Ashton Lever, turned home into his Holofusicon, or All Nature Museum. A lot of its contents were acquired from the voyages of Captain James Cook. The collection was displayed in London beginning in 1775 and passed through various owners until finally being dismantled in 1806. The contents of the museum were well recorded from a catalog the museum created in 1784 and uh, the cell catalog from 1806 and a contemporary series of watercolors of its contents, painted by British naturalist Sarah Stone. The watercolors show glass-fronted display cases containing thousands of mammals and birds, including flamingos, sloth, um, a kangaroo, and a full-sized Asian elephant. And definitely check out our website because we have one of Sarah Stone's watercolors on there and it's an amazing picture. 
Uh, the British Museum in London uh, was formed in 1759 as the result of the government's acceptance of responsibility to preserve and maintain three individual collections, mostly of manuscripts, but also containing specimens of natural history from Jamaica and a cabinet from William Corton, comprising some 100,000 items in all. Public access to the British Museum was free, but was limited to a number of tickets issued every day. Uh, and this, uh, this makes me think uh, right now of trying to get into the Smithsonian's Museum of African American History. Um, even two years after its opening, you still like have to get a reserved ticket. Right, like, like win a lottery in. of some kind. Yeah, to yeah. get in to see it. The 19th century saw an enormous increase in the popularity of studying nature. In America particularly, one didn't have to be rich or well-educated to study nature. With the exploration and movement west, Americans of all social status had access to nature. One of the grandfathers of modern natural history is John James Audubon. Audubon was born in 1785 in Saint-Domingue, which is um, modern Haiti. He was uh, the illegitimate son of a French merchant, planter, and slave trader, and a Creole woman from Saint-Domingue, probably um, one of the family's domestic servants. Audubon Sr. fled during Haiti's slave revolts to France, where Audubon was educated. When he turned 18, Audubon changed his name from Jean-Jacques Fougère Audubon to John James Audubon and moved to Pennsylvania in 1803. John James. John James. John James. Get down here, John James. (laughs) Get down here. Get down here, John James Audubon. Get your middles, John James. (laughs) Sorry. Oh, my God. Okay. Uh He became obsessed with studying and painting wild birds. There was no formal training in ornithology, so he taught himself the scientific study of birds. He shot birds he wanted to study, and then he took them back to his studio where he propped them up on twigs and sticks and painted them while they were still fresh. Sorry. I just, I don't know. I just, that's, so I don't know. When researching and writing this for some dumbass reason i always pictured him out in the field right uh-huh. with like his easel and everything like painting these birds. oh no and like learning that like he killed all of those birds and like took them back to the studio and like, just his, sitting in his <laughs> bedroom in pennsylvania <laughs> and like duh i mean now that i like know right. that i'm like of course he like killed them right and had how to, else like... would or he just he could like put a spell on them and they would <laughs> just sit there for him while he studied them <laughs> but like in my naive brain i just like imagined him just out in nature like la 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 yeah no Anyway, Not nearly as burst my nice. Yeah. Um, so uh, he conducted the first known bird banding in America by tying yarn to the legs of eastern Phoebes. By doing this, he determined that they returned to the same nesting spots year after year. He also made an enormous collection of study skins, which he used as a reference collection when creating his paintings of birds. He won renown as the foremost U.S. ornithologist for the birds of America, produced between 1827 and 1838, which included over 1,000 life-size pictures of about 500 species. After 1827, he primarily resided in Edinburgh, Scotland, and produced an ornithological biography, which consisted of five volumes, produced between 1831 and 1839, and he also produced the synopsis of Birds of North America in 1839 as well. And just something cool for you listeners, uh, we want to mention that the National Audubon Society, they actually allow you to view and download in high resolution almost all of Audubon's watercolors of birds for free. Um, I, you know, so like if you want to yeah. print them out, or like I just thought like, whoa. If you want to print them out and hang them in a poster and, in your room. Yes, because that's what I would like to do. <laughs> but I was like, wow, they're really nice and free and high res and everything. So I just thought it was a really cool thing that they do. And of course, the society also does conservation works. Uh, so they would love to have your donations. And you can check that out at audubon.org. We right. have the link in the show notes. Have you ever heard of the term twitchers? I had not until you mentioned it. Oh, so yeah. please tell us. So I, Sarah, Hanley Cousins, and myself, we both watch Midsummer Murders, which is like a British um, mystery show. They have so many episodes about twitchers. You just can't even, they're ba- they're basically like bird watchers, but a lot of them are ornithologists as well. They're like, you know, some of them are actual scientists, like some are just more like, just like to watch so these birds. So are, these aren't twitchers like in America who would be tweaking on meth? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there might be some overlap there, but generally, no. They're, that's what they're called. It's like Twitchers, and they're, like, obsessed. So I, I feel like there must be so many Twitchers in the UK that 
there's like four or five episodes on Midsummer Murders that involve communities That's of Twitchers. Weird. And they just like hop in their cars and run because they hear that, you know, someone saw a yellow bellied sapsucker and wherever. Um, it's amazing. No, I, I, I so, someone gets murdered. Yeah, every time. Gets murdered. Yeah, everyone yeah, gets murdered. I'll skip the murder part, but I did see that there were some documentaries on Twitchers alone. So I oh, might, okay. I might go yeah, check no, that out. Yeah, no, it's like a real thing. Yeah, no, no it sounds amazing. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll be honest, like, it wasn't until I moved to Western New York that I was even, like, remotely interested in birds. And now I have, like, robins coming to my backyard. Yeah. And, you know, like, I put out seeds and things like that. And I'll call everybody the window if, like, a cool bird shows up. So okay. My daughter just went on an, an ecology walk the other day because it was Earth Day. And by an ecology hike, they just meant they walked in front of the school for, like, five minutes. <laughs> but they saw a red-breasted robin. And they – she oh, came home and reported to me that's that very she saw it. Good for them. That's awesome. I know. The least interesting bird. Right, the le- that's like what all the birds look like. So, but to um, me, they're cool because I didn't grow up looking at them. Okay, yeah, so you have different beautiful. bird folk there. There we go. Uh, one of the earliest natural history museums in America was put together by a well-to-do Pennsylvanian named Charles Wilson Peel. Peel had served with George Washington at Trenton, New Jersey. After the Revolution, he opened a gallery where he displayed and sold portraits of famous revolutionaries. He began to add natural history artifacts to his displays and to devote his attention to creating a natural history museum. There were few books or resources available on taxidermy during the time, so Peel mostly taught himself how to skin and stuff animals for display. Because Peel was foremost an artist, he began making elaborate displays for the taxidermy he created. The collection grew and soon was moved to Independence Hall, where the Declaration of Independence was signed. Cool. Yes. Very, that is really cool. <laughs> yeah. Later, his brand of museum uh, opened in Baltimore in, and New York, so there's different yeah. branches, is what yeah, you're saying. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, Peel struggled financially, and he had to sell his collections. A lot of his collection was sold to P.T. Barnum. Yes, that P.T. Barnum of circus fame. And also we alluded to him in our Selling Sex episode. So listen to that one. Um, And P.T. Barnum, who many considered to be a sham and a huckster. Phineas Taylor Barnum's Dime Museum was located in Lower Manhattan at the corner of Ann and Broadway. So if you've seen the movie Gangs of New York, there is a good shot of what the museum looked like during the New York draft riot scene. Um, And besides some of its flaws, I think the recently released The Greatest Showman with Hugh Jackman did a really good job of showing what the museum looked like, at least from the outside. Barnum's American Museum was an enormous five-story building. He covered it with brightly colored banners and giant colorful posters from top to bottom. There was even a taxidermy shop where for a fee you could drop off your dead pet and have it stuffed and ready to take home by the end of the day. <laughs> My mother-in-law has a uh, what has one of her parrots that is stuffed. Really? Yeah. It's, okay. It's there in the in the dining room. All right. <laughs> Different strokes. <laughs> um Inside, he had the first floor gallery filled with glass cases or cabinets of stuffed animals. Barnum boasted that his American Museum was an encyclopedic synopsis of everything worth seeing in this curious world. (laughs) It was said that his museum housed over 850,000 curiosities, some of them real and some of them fake, of course. He was famous for showcasing outlandish hoaxes and made it no secret that part of the fun of the museum was not really knowing what was real and what was fake. (laughs) One of Barnum's most famous and most audacious deceptions played on the tools of the natural history connoisseurs. He obtained a taxidermy mount of a quote-unquote mermaid. Instead of displaying it right away, however, Barnum wildly hyped the mermaid, filling papers with tales of how the strange taxidermy mermaid was discovered in the far-off islands of Hawaii. He named it the Fiji mermaid, and not Fiji like how you would spell Fiji, like F-I-J-I, but (laughs) F-E-J-E-E, right? (laughs) So he called it the Fiji mermaid. Um, Posters advertised a voluptuous womanly mermaid like the sea sirens of fictional lore. But when the public was finally admitted to see the mermaid, after weeks of Barnum's hype, they were sorely disappointed to find an extremely shriveled 18-inch long mermaid. It was an obvious fake, the work of Japanese craftsmen stitching together a monkey torso and a fishtail as a novelty sold to sailors. Um, But for Barnum, it was all fun and it was all part of his showman shtick. Um, 
However, real naturalists were infuriated. Barnum was making a farce of their science. He had bought up all of Peel's specimens and was profiting off of natural history for inglorious, self-absorbed fame. So I, I'm just jumping in to say that I have been, like, dying to do a whole episode on the Fiji mermaid at some point. Um, not just because of this whole scientific angle of it, which is, of course, really, really important, but also because it sets off sort of a firestorm of duels and almost duels in the South. Awesome. W- with this, you know, very, you know... Um, intense honor culture that the American South had during the 18, you know, what, what years was this again? The 1850s? Yeah, roughly. Um, because it, um, when people were duped by the Fiji mermaid, there was this whole thing where there was a guy who was duped by the Fiji mermaid and yeah. he took it as an affront to his honor because oh someone called him out for, yeah, be, for being like, an being, idiot. For, <laughs> and it was, at some point I want to come back to this because it, it gets into this whole thing about Southern masculinity and honor culture and, um, when you would reveal the lie, like accuse someone else of um, being untruthful, Mm -hmm. it could like have literally deadly consequences. And there's one whole episode that's all about the Fiji mermaid. And I just think it's fascinating. So, okay. Yeah. Just because the humiliation of having fall for it, like, yeah, you totally lose your honor. I've, yes, that makes sense. I don't know if you have been to the uh, Buffalo history museum lately, but they actually have a copy of it there. Like an artifact, like a, like a, they have a, yeah. I've seen it. I mean, there's all, yeah, there's like tons of them that were made, right? Mm-hmm. So I think, the I can't museum remember. Has one. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, what, oh, did I say history? history? Oh, I meant the science museum. But it's it's one that was actually displayed at the Pan Am Expo in 1901 when, oh, okay. when it was held here in Buffalo. So okay. I doubt it's actually Barnum's. It's probably a different one. One mm-hmm. of these, you know, these are everywhere. Right. right. And like, quote unquote, freak shows and things like that. But, yeah. Um. Okay, so uh, (laughs) getting back to our story. So there were also American movements among the scientific community and naturalist hunters um, who wanted to establish more respectable natural history museums. One was, of course, the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. The Smithsonian Institution came into existence through the remarkable bequest of nearly one half million dollars in 1838 from James Smithson, an Englishman. He was impressed with the democratization of science in America, and he gave his entire fortune to the United States with the wish to, quote, found at Washington under the name of the Smithsonian Institution, an establishment for the increase and diffusion of knowledge among men. Um, And just an interesting aside here, he had his fortune shipped to the United States in 10 wooden box crates aboard a ship. Each crate was filled with a thousand pounds of gold. Um, I I, I don't know. Sounds legit. Yeah, (laughs) totally. Here you go. Here's some money. I know. Uh, Anyway, but, you know, so nobody, when this, like, when he bequeathed his money, no one really uh, was sure what this institution should be. Some argued that it should be a natural uh, observatory. Others said it should be a university, some a library, some a museum. Uh, And this all produced a bit of a stalemate in attempt to, in an attempt to force Congress's hand to kind of move this along. Former secretary of war, Joel Poinsett created the National Institute for the Promotion of Science. He wanted the new institution to be the caretaker of the collections from the United States Exploring Expedition. The United States Exploring Expedition was um, sometimes called the USXX or simply the XX. This was an um, uh, this was an ambitious expedition between the years of 1838 and 1842, consisting of six sailing vessels and 346 men, including nine scientists and artists. Besides establishing a stronger diplomatic presence throughout the Pacific, the expedition sought to provide much-needed charts to American whalers, sealers, and China traders throughout the Pacific Ocean. The XX was conducted under, under the direction of Charles Wilkes. One of the naturalists on board was Titian Peel, the son of uh, Charles Wilson Peel, whose natural history collections had been sold off to, to uh, P.T. Barnum. Titian Peel had already uh, accompanied expeditions to Florida and the West. He was a capable artist and an excellent naturalist hunter. The XX brought back tons of artifacts. The collection was first housed in the newly built U.S. Patent Office and overseen by Wilkes. He had a sign installed over the entrance to the rooms where the collection was housed that read, Collection of the Exploring Expedition in large gold letters. 
In 1846, the U.S. Congress passed legislation establishing the Smithsonian as an institution charged with representing, quote, all objects of art and curious research, natural history, plants, and geological and mineralogical specimens belonging to the United States. The U.S. National Museum opened in 1858 as part of the Smithsonian's scientific program and formed the first of its many museums, most of which stand along the mall in Washington, D.C., but it still wasn't clear at the beginning exactly what the Smithsonian Institution would be. At, uh, its first director, Joseph Henry, was insistent that the institution be solely for scientific research, not a museum. Henry was part of a young group of scientists who were replacing the amateur collectors of the previous era. He envisioned the institution as a place for the practice of new sciences. He wanted space for laboratories and wanted the publication of scientific results. He did not want the resources of the endowment to maintain the display of uh, a substantial collection of artifacts that would require a large, expensive building and a sizable staff. One of his first moves was to refuse the XX collection, and so it stayed at the patent office. Now, luckily for us, meaning the people who love to geek out at museums, there was enough interest in Congress for the Smithsonian Institution to become America's National Museum. A new building was commissioned, which is now known as the Castle on the Mall. It's a palatial, ornate Norman design, and yeah, it looks like a castle. By 1850, it was clear that Henry needed an assistant to handle museum matters. The first museum curator hired was a man named Spencer Baird. Baird had always been a naturalist collector. He started out as a boy corresponding with John James Audubon, who was uh, in the process of preparing his book, The Viviparous Quadrupeds of North America. That's a catchy title there. <laughs> Um, which uh, included descriptions and illustrations of every mammal on the continent. Audubon and his partner, John Bachman, recruited uh, an army of boy hunters to send them specimens of mice, shrews, rats, all manner of small mammals for examination. Audubon became one of Baird's mentors and taught him how to draw and introduced him to the best taxidermists of the period. Can I just say, that seems like they're breeding serial killers. They're like, hey, little boys, go kill all these animals and send them to me. Too much true crime? Yeah, right. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Baird had even been one of the people charged with sorting and labeling all of the zoological collections from the U.S. XX when they were initially shipped to Washington. Baird became the first curator of the Smithsonian Institution in 1850 and oversaw the transfer of the XX collection to the Smithsonian in 1858. The institution's collection had already grown to the extent that the XX collection accounted for just one-fifth of the institution's total natural history holdings. The enormous space of the Smithsonian's Hall allowed Baird to expand and refresh the original XX exhibit, and much as Wilkes had done at the Patent Office 15 years before, the words, quote, National Museum of the United States, uh, were placed above the entrance. One way Baird filled the Smithsonian with examples of natural history is he enlisted the help of auxiliary naturalists to help build the museum. Taking a cue from his mentor, Audubon, Baird enlisted the help of naturalist foot soldiers in the U.S. Army. When the U.S. Congress authorized the Pacific Railroad Surveys of 1853 to 1855 to figure out the best routes for the Transcontinental Railroad, the survey team of engineers and surveyors was accompanied by thousands of soldiers. Baird recruited soldiers to collect natural history data along the way. Many soldiers signed down to help. A lot of them were already amateur naturalists and crack shots. Plus, Baird made a point of recruiting army medics, whose familiarity with anatomy made them better at preparing specimens. The Pacific Railroad surveys resulted in the collection of thousands of specimens for the Smithsonian Museum. To be clear, most natural history museums from the 19th century were filled with flora and fauna collected by both professional naturalists and amateurs. Teddy Roosevelt was one such amateur. As a child and young adult, he'd made his own museum of natural history in a room of his family's New York City home. What a nerd. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, before he married his first wife, Alice, he dismantled his collection and sent most of the specimens to the Smithsonian Institute and the New York American 
American Museum of Natural History. When he did so, though, he was just like hundreds of other amateur naturalists around the world who regularly donated their specimens to natural history museums. Roosevelt, however, continued to ship specimens to both museums throughout his lifetime, many of which are still there. Just for example, the Smithsonian still has some of the study skins of voles collected by uh, Roosevelt, one from 1870 that he made when he was only 12 years old. Two of the elephants in the Akeley Hall of African Mammals at the American Museum in Newark were shot by Roosevelt and his son Kermit. Men like Roosevelt called themselves hunter-naturalists. It's a 19th century term for avid hunters who were also students of nature. People like John James Audubon, Charles and Titian Peale, and the famed taxidermist Charles Ackley, who we'll discuss in a minute, also fit the term. Hunter-naturalists were also seen as a key component of conservation efforts. Magazines such as Forest and Stream began in earnest around 1876 to advocate for sportsmen to study the animals they hunted set reasonable limits on hunts, and adopt a strict code of hunting conduct, sportsmanship, so that there might be something left to hunt in the future. People knew that animals were going extinct. The bison, for instance, were almost completely gone, where they had once roamed in the millions. People knew that something had to be done in order to protect and conserve what nature there was left. The hunter-naturalists displayed an ecological consciousness and a commitment to conservation and wildlife management, but they were not sentimental nor overly romantic about nature. John Burroughs, an American naturalist and nature essayist who was extremely active in the U.S. conservation movement, remarked, quote, Nature does not care whether the hunter slay the beast or the beast the hunter. She will make good compost of them both, and her ends are prospered whichever succeeds. But they were not without their detractors. Many called them game butchers and decried any type of hunting, particularly of big game, that were becoming more and more scarce. Most of the big game in the American West was decimated, and that was beginning to happen to many African species in the late 19th century, too. For natural history museums, however, the way they got their exhibits, by hunting, killing, skinning, and stuffing animal specimens. Collecting animals for the education of posterity seemed like the last hope for many conservationists. One of these people was taxidermist Carl Ackley. He brought a revolutionary level of detail to his work, which featured molded muscles and tendons covered with real skin and fur. Essentially, he was reconstructing the animal from the inside out. Dioramas by Ackley and others like him were built for conservation's sake. They were bringing nature to the public, trying to show people what the animals looked like in their natural habitat. They wanted the public to appreciate nature, even though hundreds of animals were being killed in order to get the perfect specimen. In 1909, Ackley accompanied Theodore Roosevelt on a year-long expedition in Africa funded by the Smithsonian Institution, and he began working at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, where his efforts can still be seen in the Ackley Hall of African Mammals, where the previously mentioned elephants shot by the Roosevelts are still on display, taxidermy by Ackley. It was a means by which the natural history museums hoped to preserve images of these species, which they felt were in danger of extinction. Egli never stopped being a taxidermist, but he was able to persuade the Belgian government to create the first wildlife sanctuary in Africa, which in turn probably protected the mountain gorillas from going extinct. So needless to say, the legacy of these 19th century naturalist hunters and natural history museums is really complicated. Mm -hmm. Now, um, it's safe to say that natural history museums have inspired thousands of people to become scientists themselves. It's impossible to count how many school children have seen these exhibits over the years and went on to do great things in their lives. These museums inspire us uh, and connect us to a larger world. And they're also, however, products of their time and our historical artifacts in themselves. For example, natural history museums often misrepresent nature in profound ways. One way is in the sex ratio of animal exhibits. A case study published in 2008 found that in a typical natural history gallery, 
uh, that only uh, 29% of the animals and 34% of the birds were female. And so if you're thinking about all these naturalist hunters out in the world killing these animals for the purpose of being mounted as museum specimens, they're going to want to send the largest specimens, the animals with big horns, antlers, um, tusks, or showy plumage. And those types of animals are typically the male in the species. So, although understandable, the sex bias creates a misrepresentation of nature. Additionally, the study found that in most displays of male and female specimens of the same species, when displayed together, the males were typically positioned in a domineering pose over the female, irrespective of biological realities. Other ways natural history museums highlight their grounding in the 19th century is through their colonial lens. Collecting became part of the act of colonization. Uh, for example, American natural history museums are full of artifacts from the conquered West and Southwest. In British museums, there are larger amounts of artifacts and specimens from colonial holdings like Australia than, say, from places like China. But natural history museums aren't all that we see as visitors. Behind closed doors, they house shelves and shelves of thousands of specimens. The average institution displays only about 1% or less of its store. The rest, often hundreds of thousands of specimens, is cataloged and stored away inaccessible to the public. And those specimens are actually still producing scientific discoveries. Natural history collections from across the globe hold thousands of species awaiting identification. Researchers today actually find more new animal and plant species by sifting through decade-old specimens than they do by going out into the field and surveying tropical forests and remote landscapes. An estimated three-quarters of newly named mammal species are already part of a natural history collection at the time that they were identified. Unfortunately, they can sometimes sit unrecognized for a century or longer, hidden in drawers, half-forgotten in jars, misidentified, or unlabeled. These collections are becoming increasingly valuable thanks to newly developed techniques. DNA sequencing, digital registries, and other advances are allowing scientists to study existing museum collections in new ways. It shows more about Earth's biodiversity, but also how quickly that diversity is disappearing. Unfortunately, as these collections are growing more valuable, they are also quickly falling into decline. Many institutions like museums and universities are struggling with significant budget cuts. This results in many collections being neglected, damaged, or lost altogether. Additionally, the scientists who study them are also dwindling as their academic positions disappear. Across North America, more than 100 herbaria, or preserved plant specimens and associated data used for scientific study, have closed in the past two decades. In the United Kingdom, at least 64 museums have closed since 2010, with the majority of those being natural history type museums. There was a pretty big ruckus over a collection in Louisiana a few years ago when Monroe University told the biology department they had to find another institution to take over its extensive collection of Louisiana plants and fish, one of the largest and most complete in the state, within a few months or the collection would be destroyed. Now, through the power of social media, people kind of got up in arms and the university ended up backing away from that threat. But unfortunately, that case um, was not really out of the norm. It's becoming more and more typical. These collections are overseen by a shrinking contingent of managers and curators. And we're not just talking about small university collections. We're talking about big ones. For example, the Field Museum in Chicago, Illinois, had 39 curators in 2001. There were 21 in 2015. The National Museum of Natural History had 122 curators in 1993 and only 81 in 2015. Many museums are emphasizing education and entertainment as they cut back on curatorial staff. Museums are trying to reach a wider audience by digitizing their collections and making them more accessible, which makes the collection more widely available for research and even accessible to the general public. But of course, that also takes money and time, and that's something that many institutions simply just do not have. So we've given you a lot to think about, right? We uh, invite you to visit our show notes at digpodcast.org for sources and further reading. 
And I just want to mention that we've also completely skipped over the anthropological human aspect of these types of museums. But I don't want you to worry because Sarah Hanley Cousins is going to cover that whole jar of worms in a future episode. Yes. Um, and I just want the, – the most interesting part of this to me, I think, is the colonial aspect of it. And I have sometimes when I've taught courses to my students on world history, when we get to um, the 19th century and we start talking about – um, cabinets of curiosities and things like that. Mm-hmm. My students can never really make that connection that having a cabinet filled with like, you know, shrunken heads or whatever, that that's sort of like exploitative and and it's like in line with those colonial ideas of, oh, let's help these savages or whatever. Right. It's, it's hard for some people to um, make that connection. Uh, but I don't think it's a coincidence that these two things were happening at the same time. No. no. So I'm glad that you pointed that. I just think that's the most interesting part of it. Maybe we should have an episode about that. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, we probably should. I mean, for example, when I was a forensic anthropology uh, major as an undergrad, you know, we had the osteology room, right? So like part of our... Uh, training or whatever, it, like our final was we were just given this box of like random bones, right? And we had to pick out, you know, the the sex and the age and, and, and the race and all of these people that were, were in this box. I mean, as much as, as you can, right? Mm-hmm. With, with, with bones and osteology. Um, you know, and the majority of the bones we have or we had were from the 19th century from basically poor Irish immigrants, Mm -hmm. right? These people were people who didn't have anybody to claim their bodies, right? They ended up in potter's graves and things like that. So a lot of like collections like that are of the exploited, right? And then again, Sarah's Mm going to go into kind of the, the, the human anthropological aspect of like, you know, having native American remains in museums and things like that, Mm -hmm. um, which is all within this kind of lens of colonialism. Right. So we'll definitely... We'll definitely and adjust that in another episode. For right. Sure. And I'm sure like with this, that, that, you know, animal rights activists or whatever would be, would be up in arms. And it's really, you know, interesting because I was thinking that natural history museums kind of serve those people, but at the same time they don't. <laughs> yeah. It, it, so. I mean, I think that was, that was a thing for me that was like, duh, how, how did these specimens get there? And I guess for me too, it was really interesting to see that these collections are still valuable. And I hadn't really thought of, of that, 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 that there are taxonomists who are still going in and finding new species, right? Right. Yep. Um, but we don't really collect that kind of, uh, that do that collecting uh, as much as, as, as was before. But like I was, you know, when I was reading through sources or whatever, um, somebody was quoted as saying, you know, if you want to study the taxonomy of animals in Kuala Lumpur from 40 years ago, the only way you can do that is to go into natural history collections. Right. No, I mean, right? that makes sense. Yeah. It makes me wonder if there was any discussion about the ethical part of, you know, the killing the animals, only because that's the same, This the 19th century is also when vegetarianism mm-hmm. started becoming a thing also. Mm-hmm. So it's... It's interesting to think about that. Yeah, I mean, um, and that was kind of part of this, like, naturalist hunter. I mean, you know, the the, the goal is, of course, to kill with one shot, mm-hmm. you know, and that was kind of one of uh, the jokes about TR or whatever. He, he wasn't actually, like, the best shot, you know, so it uh-huh. would take, like, a couple of, of rounds before he could, like, bring down a big animal. Yeah, you know. Um, so, you know, definitely there was this, this idea of, like, do it as, as quickly and as painfully painlessly as possible right um but yeah i mean there was a a large outcry from the general public as well you know we mentioned the the butcher butcher hunters or whatever Mm -hmm. you know and Mm -hmm. so so there was already this movement to to curb the killing of animals for this type of taxidermy essentially right but like kind of it's nice i mean not nice but it's you know i'm sure that people who are sort of figuring out the taxonomies of these different species are Mm -hmm. really thankful that they have those those samples, yeah, you know, yeah. so. But, know. you know, and then there's this kind of like public versus private, right? Are they in a public museum or in they, are they in somebody's private trophy room, mm-hmm. right? And so then there there comes kind of more ethical questions. Right, like right. Like who, who is and who is not allowed to have access to these type of animals. Mm-hmm. Wow, so, it's a, a lot. lot to think about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I liked this episode because it definitely made me think about some aspects of um, natural history that I that I wasn't yeah. aware of before. It makes me think of early modern European paintings of animals where you can tell they've never seen one. <laughs> right. You right. know what I mean? We should, yeah. oh my God, we should have to put one of those on our blog. Because, you know, just picture of like a zebra that looks like 
not a zebra. Like a dog with stripes. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, um, and then there's another thing that you need to do because I was going to talk about menageries. Right. And I decided that that was just a whole other thing. It is. It's a whole other box can so of worms. I think but you should do that one. Yeah, I was, yeah, I, we, I totally will because okay. they, we, I think they have an area right now outside of the Tower of London that now it's just like a, it's a moat with grass grown yeah. over it or whatever, but it used to, it used be, to be where like yeah. Henry VIII's lion was stored or whatever. But all the way into the 19th century. It was, it was there. Did they? Yeah, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know how long research. it lasted. Yeah, that was but... part of the research site, and then I was like, you know what, this thing's going to be four hours before Oh, cool. That. So, yeah, so you should definitely jump oh, in Oh, yeah, there. definitely. Okay. Okay. Anyway. So, <laughs> that's all we have for you today. Yeah. So, thanks for listening. You can follow us on uh, iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. Find us on Insta, Facebook, Pinterest, YouTube. What else? Twitter. 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 And Facebook. Twitter. Join us, group. yeah. Join us on our Facebook group at what is it? Dig History Pod Squad. Yeah, just mostly for very cool history memes. Yeah. All right. Thanks for listening. Okay. Bye. Bye. The former Secretary of War Joyle into the laboratory. Should I say laboratory or laboratory? Okay. What? <laughs> if you say laboratory, you have to say it. Okay. Laboratory. Audubon was born at seven. Was born. He was born. <laughs> he was born. He was done birth. He was done. Born in seventeen eighty five. <laughs> in its Greek form, how would you say that? Muse, museion? Moussaka. No, Mus- I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, perhaps. It's a That's Greek a Greek food. food, right? Yeah. Whose familiar, familiarity, oh my god. Familiarity. To Paleolithic times. Paleo. Laboratory. You say paleo? Uh huh. That's why I like it's the... paleo. Paleo. No, That's why the not. diet's called paleo. <laughs> it's called paleo. Say no. paleo, please. I have never, ever said paleo. Please, right. please don't embarrass us. Say paleo. <laughs> paleo? <laughs> Says the person who wanted to say laboratory. <laughs> which is the proper way to say it. We just don't. Oh, my God. <laughs> Turned his home into his holo... <sighs> yeah, good luck. <laughs> I don't know what that is. There you go. Okay. Sounds good. Museums are trying to weech. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs>